of, of OPAG. I think uh, asteroid folks tend to call it Ganymed on purpose uh, just to make sure there's no, uh, there's no confusion there. Uh, so these are S-class asteroids. They'd be expected to be anhydrous. Um, when looking at their IR spectra, um, we associate Ganymed with being kind of a, a, a silicate basalt-like Vesta, so an, an igneous kind of object. Eros is more like an L or LL chondrite, so uh, primitive but not uh, hydrated kind of, kind of meteorite. They both made excellent apparitions uh, to the Earth in 2011, 2012. Um, so we used uh, the ground-based uh, NASA IRTF. We used a spectrometer uh, in a, a mode that got us from two to four microns all at once. Um, and observed several nights when, when these objects were bright enough to get good data. It looks like nine nights uh, for Ganymed and seven nights for Eros. And I should have said it first, but I'll say now. So this work um, is, it's, it's been accepted on, by Icarus. It's available on the archive. It, it's, I don't know when it's going to actually appear on the Icarus website. Uh, so most of what you'll see is, is it should be in that, uh, that archive paper. Uh-oh. This just beeped at me. Um, so as, again, anyone who's, who's looked at uh, these wavelengths on the moon knows, there's thermal flux uh, because these objects are hot, uh, at least hot enough to give thermal flux at these wavelengths. And so you have to handle that. Um, these uh, spectra here show, um, I think this is Ganymed, over the 2.2 to 4 micron range at different nights. And you can see that the flux just uh, takes off compared to the, the reflected flux. Uh, Asteroid spectroscopists and asteroid researchers have, have developed models over the past three decades to kind of look at this. It's all of our data is point source data, so it, it doesn't have the kind of details that something like uh, Diviner or, or people looking at M-cube data would want to use, but it's, it's pretty well in hand. Um, and then there have also been some, some recent work for asteroids to try to back out the thermal properties of the surface uh, from the kinds of uh, model data that we get. Um, so we actually can get a estimate of the thermal inertia. Um, let's see if this flips it here. Uh, this uh, shows um, work by uh, Marco Delbo. Uh, there's this uh, value called eta, which is the beaming parameter, which is basically a fudge factor in asteroid thermal models that takes into account everything that you don't really want to handle analytically. Um, it's been found that this factor varies with phase angle, and depending on the thermal inertia, you get uh, particular values of, of eta at particular phase angles for a, a given thermal inertia. Uh, all of these points here are NEOs. Uh, these points down here are uh, Eros and Ganymed. And then the different shades are forward models, simulations of, uh, of asteroids. This bottom rank here, and I'm colorblind, so I'm, I'm just take everyone's word for what these colors are. Um, that's green, maybe. That's like uh, a thermal inertia of 20 in SI units. Um, this is like 200 or so, and then this is much higher, like 1,000. Uh, when you do the numbers a couple different ways, you find that Eros and Ganymed have thermal inertias around 200, plus or minus. So higher than the moon, but not, not hugely high. Uh, given this, this huge thermal flux, um, it's not necessarily obvious where to draw the, the continuum, the spectral continuum from which you'd measure uh, your band depth. Uh, so at least in the case of Eros, we're lucky. We think we have a, a good meteorite analog. We can take the meteorites into the lab and say, OK, what should the continuum value be for, for, those, uh, for Eros? Uh, for Ganymed, we have much less of a good idea. There are a few different analogs that have been proposed. Um, there's a little bit of data from the WISE satellite that, that you can use. Um, but by and large, there's, there's a little bit of, of uncertainty in, in the Ganymed um, continuum value and where you draw it. Luckily, it doesn't change the results any. Uh, so here you go. Uh, the top here is Ganymed. The bottom is Eros. We've, I've drawn a, a dashed line here to show where the continuum is. Um, and uh, on the nights with the best data, it's clear that there's a band of a couple percent, at least, on both of these objects. Uh, we see this band on, on multiple nights. We don't necessarily see it on all nights. Uh, that may be a data quality issue. Um, it's consistent with OH or H2O, uh, you know, go, heading toward this uh, band 
uh, minimum at about 2.7 AU. These are telescopic data from uh, the surface of the Earth. They're taken from Mauna Kea, so they're high-ish above the surface of the Earth, uh, but there's still plenty of atmosphere in the way. So you can't really get any usable data between about 2.5 and, and 2.8 or 2.85 microns just because water in the Earth's atmosphere basically blocks everything that's coming in when you have objects that are as faint as this. Although I do have a caveat coming up in a few slides, I think. Um, so this is a couple percent, like I said, if you want to compare to um, kind of a, a low albedo asteroid, something that's more like what we think the carbonaceous chondrites are like, uh, that's, that's an asteroid like this. This is kind of randomly-ish chosen, and you can see that this, this band goes 15 or 20 percent. So the bands we're seeing on these asteroids are, are much, uh, much shallower. Um, I believe they're also shallower than the lunar absorption, although I should, I should recheck that. Uh, we don't see an, any obvious change with geometry, so we don't see band depths changing with phase angle in a way that we m might have looked for. We don't see an obvious change with uh, solar distance, um, which we might also have expected. It's possible that there is a correlation with uh, the, the, where we are on the surface, so the longitude or, or latitude on these asteroids. Oh, here, this shows uh, Ganymede on the nine different nights. The dashed line, sh again, shows this continuum. And most nights, you have, you have uh, a clear absorption. Some nights, you don't. Um, whether or not, again, those are the nights with the worst data. Not every night is a, is a good night at the telescope. Uh, for Eros, we have the benefit that we have had a spacecraft at Eros. We have a good idea of the shape. We have a really well-defined uh, coordinate system. We know how fast it's rotating. Uh, so this is using the small body mapping tool at, uh, at APL. Uh, Carolyn Ernst uh, helped me out with that, so I'll, so I'll call her out specifically. Um, this is an attempt to kind of show uh, everything at once. So the, we've got the date, we've got the distance from the sun, we have the band depth at 2.95 microns and the band depth at 3 microns. And the, the punchline here is that uh, these change uh, with respect to one another. So you can take, for instance, this view of Eros and this view of Eros, um, and the lighting has changed a little bit, so only the, the kind of nose facing you is lit in both cases. In this case, you've got a 4% band depth and at, at both wavelengths. Here you've got a 3% band depth at 2.95 microns and only a 0.7 mi uh, percent band depth at 3.1. So that suggests these, these band depths are changing uh, with relative to each other and relative to, again, position. Uh, someone more clever and or with more time than me uh, would be able to go and say, okay, so if you mask out this part of Eros, you could map the band depths and map which parts are, are more and less hydrated. Um, however, as I said, not all nights are created equal. And I'll point, uh, these are maybe a little low for you to see. These are basically the same view at close to the same distance from the sun, um, and they have very different numbers from one another. They also have very big error bars. So uh, that's the two minutes? Yeah, two, minutes yeah, two, minutes two minutes left. All right, we can do that. Um, so you know, probably we'd also want additional data to kind of really nail this down to be, to be certain that this sort of effect is happening. Um, I'll skip these. Uh, this, again, is, is just kind of showing a, a measure of that band shape, the 3.1 to 2.95. Uh, micron reflectance ratio versus solar distance. Um, the optimists might say, hey, look, there's a trend. The pessimists might say, no, the trend is thrown off, and these are all within one sigma of the mean anyway. Uh, so again, this is intriguing and suggestive, but I don't think we can quite say for sure that anything's going on. Um, we can quantify this and actually back out a value for the hydrogen concentration on these asteroids. Uh, there's two different approaches we could take. One is by looking at VESTA, or lunar data, uh, for which we have both a neutron spectrometer and we have IR uh, spectrometers measuring the surface, and just kind of do a ballpark and say, okay, for a, a band depth of such and such uh, percentage, what is the hydrogen that's implied? Uh, we can also go um, and look at uh, the, the kind of work that uh, Ralph Milliken and his students and his group have done. Um, and use uh, something like the SPAT parameter to try to figure out how much water is indicated. In both cases, we kind of end up with a few hundred ppm of hydrogen on Eros and Ganymede being, uh, looking like they, they could 
explain this, uh, this band depth. Uh, also note, Patrick Koplowski used the near XGRS recently uh, and estimated a much higher amount of hydrogen on arrows, but the error bars are pretty big and it's, again, consistent. Uh, okay, is this uh, contamination from impactors? Is this solar wind? I don't think we can necessarily say um, if it's contamination from impactors, it seems like a lot of contamination, but it's not more than what people think is happening on Vesta, so, so maybe that's consistent. Uh, Ganymed has an app helium out at 4 AU, and um, it passes through the plane of uh, the ecliptic plane in the middle of the asteroid belt. So it's possible it picks some stuff up. All right, so uh, I, will, I think I'm just about out of time, so I will skip ahead to the conclusions. Um, right, there's, there's more work to do. Um, and just to, uh, to kind of reiterate here, uh, we observed two, the two largest NEOs in the three micron region. We found uh, absorption bands in the three micron region of a few percent. There may, there's some hints that there's variation across their surfaces, um, and we think that, we're, that this indicates a few hundred ppm of hydrogen on their surfaces. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, any questions for our speaker? Oh, have a bike. Hey, Andy. Uh, so we will compare different locations for the band depth. Uh, have you compared the other bands, like uh, the reflectance are identical? Because thermal issue can give you some band depth difference. Compare the other bands as in? Like a, like a longer, like a 3.8, 3.6. So we don't see, yeah, we um, don't see other bands out there. Um, and I think that these are probably hot enough that you'd get some of the kind of thermal fill-in issues that, that people talk about if you did have a band there. Um, for Eros, Eros's albedo is pretty, I mean, from, from near Shoemaker, uh, I don't think the albedo on Eros changes very much across the surface, um, but looking to see if there are albedo connections is an obvious, an obvious thing to do, yeah. Okay, and uh, you can ask some more.